But since most people don't know who he is, my PowerPoint presentation tonight is almost every picture that I have of him. And in fact, I don't have enough pictures to do an hour long presentation. So there's other stuff tucked into there. And for those of you who create evening programs and know a little bit about how that process works, this is my outline. It tells me where I am. So you'll catch me once in a while glimpsing at it to see what story I'm supposed to be telling. It works. <laughs> my first outline for this story, because I tell, the sto I tell them so differently, my first outline for this program was just a series of words. I see more people coming. So my countdown and my introduction is part of this, and that I'll start that in about a minute. How many people here are actually familiar with what I would like to call real living history, the true living history? Okay. This ain't it. <laughs> This is the Ron version, the Ranger Ron version of living history. All right. You ready to turn that sound system on, Mike, or is it on? It's on? So just to introduce myself a little bit, at the moment, my name is Ranger Ron, and I'm kind of the old man of the place now. Mike's been here longer than I have, but uh, I've been here a little over 18 years. I came here 18 and a half years ago, expecting to stay 10 weeks, and all these years later, I'm still here. So for those of you who are familiar with real living history, the truest art form of living history, you know perfectly well that this is not it. For a character to come out and come out of his character, to break character, is just unheard of. You would not go to Colonial Williamsburg and see somebody introducing themselves as themselves. For the most part, you don't even go to something like a Civil War battlefield and see people introducing themselves as themselves. In fact, when I was trained to do living history, one of the things that they taught me was that in its purest form, if you're going to do living history, you must dress as your character right down to your underwear. Not that anybody's ever going to see your underwear, but apparently you move differently in old hand-woven wool stuff than you do in the modern underwear. So. <laughs> That's the purest of the art form. You never break character. There's an incredible amount of research that goes into it. You either play a historical character that people know about, or you can make up your own character. If you go hear Sheldon Johnson over at Yosemite, that character that he plays is, was a real person, but nobody really knows that much about that character. So Sheldon has made the character himself. The character that I play is Captain Hans, and he was the first settler here. He did put in the first stagecoach. He did bring the first cabin and brought the first tourists. But very few people know who he is. I used to have some people trained that could do this introduction for me. But nowadays, I kind of do it myself. So in the purest art form, for me to come out and introduce myself as Ranger Ron is kind of unheard of. But there are other forms of living history. And one of the coolest ones I ever saw that really excited me, and it's what triggered my ability to do this, was a program that I saw presented by a young lady. And she played three different characters, all of whom were male. 
And the way she did it was she switched hats. And when she put on the hard hat, she was a certain character. When she put on the fedora, she was a different character. And when she put on a baseball cap, she was a third person. And you very quickly picked up the idea that whichever hat she was was whichever character she was playing. I kind of do something like that. I have the hat here and I have the cane. And when you see me with the hat and cane, you will know that you are no longer in the presence of Ranger Ron. You are in the presence of Captain Hans. I do modify my voice a little bit to talk about the kind of the way I grew up learning about it. But Captain Hans, it would be easy to argue, and some of the folks who've been here for a while have heard me say, Captain Hans is the reason you are here. The vast majority of people throughout most of history thought of the Grand Canyon as a terrible place, a place to be avoided. This was one of the first great North American wonders to be discovered. Long before white settlers had laid eyes on Yellowstone or Yosemite, frankly, before they had ever laid eyes on Niagara Falls, there were already Spanish explorers here. They took one look at the place and decided it was awful. They rode away and stayed away for hundreds of years until the Civil War happened. When the Civil War happened, a lot of young men who would never have traveled more than a few miles away from home, Captain Hans was one of them. He was a river boy in Tennessee. They walked in that war. They marched all over the country. And when that war was over, the ones that lived just kept walking. And many of them came out here. Captain Hans tried his hand at mining. He was looking for gold. He never found gold. He did find asbestos, which you're not exactly going to get rich, mining asbestos out of the bottom of the Grand Canyon. There are cases where he sold his mining claims for what in the modern world would have been you know, half a million dollars, and a few weeks later he was totally broke. Apparently he had a gambling problem. But Captain Hans loved to tell stories. He loved to have an audience. He usually dressed very nicely. He changed his beard over time, but I'm not going to change mine. I wear the beard as he, a young man and the clothes of an old man. But he did dress always very nicely. He kind of talked ramrod straight, and he kind of told a lot of stories. He would spin them out. Captain Hans loved to start with something almost believable, head off into something highly unlikely, and end up with something totally nuts. <laughs> Captain Hans used to say that he could not only convince a tourist, and you would have been called tourists in those days, he said that he could not only convince a tourist that there were frogs in the Grand Canyon. Once he convinced them there was frogs in the Grand Canyon, he'd convince them that those frogs ate bird eggs. And once he had people figured out that there were bird egg eating frogs, then he'd convince them that those frogs carried that egg a full mile to the sacred Kraken Rock to crack it on before they would eat it. This was the kind of stuff he loved to do. He would tell his stories and weave them along. And he became so popular that people came to meet Captain Hans. They came here as much to see him as they did to see the canyon. And since he had the best accommodations on the rim, and since he basically was the one who started bringing people up, people were fascinated by this man. As he got older, it got to the point where he no longer was taking people into the canyon as much, although people always wanted to see him. But eventually he was paid by the Fred Harvey Company just to hang around and tell stories. And he would wander around and tell these stories. The stories you're going to hear tonight are his stories, but none of them is told the way he would have told them because he changed them all the time. He modified those stories on a regular basis. And there are no written accounts of his stories as he told them. There are just descriptions of his stories. And he certainly would have never told his stories all at once like I'm about to do. But he loved to tell them. And what I've done is I've taken the description of his stories and try to figure out how I would tell the stories. Stories are alive. Your story is alive. The story of the Grand Canyon is important, 
and the story of the Grand Canyon continues to this very day. You are very much a part of it. So Captain Hance is a fellow that I really admire. It was said about Captain Hance that if you've come to the Grand Canyon and you've only seen the scenery and you haven't met Captain Hance, you've missed half of the show. So would you like to meet Captain Hance? Let's see if I can find him for you. Well, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, welcome to my home. My name is Captain John Hance. And I will have you know that I was the first settler here at the Grand Canyon, the first white man to spend the winter here. Now, 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 there was always people here before me. You know, the native people, those Indians were always here. The, the, the Apaches and, uh, and the Havasupais and the uh, Navajos. And, and, you know, this was their land. But I got along with them pretty good. You know, uh, 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 I think they only killed me two or three times. But I got along with them all right. And, and the truth of it is, in, in the earliest days... Nobody wanted to come here. This was not a popular place. In fact, I didn't want to come here. You see, I was a young boy that had fought in the Civil War. I was a young Tennessee boy, and, and when that war started, I did just what every young Southern boy did. I shouldered my squirrel and rifle, and I went marching off the Whistling Dixie, headed off to battle and glory. And I was a terrible soldier. The very first thing I managed to do on my very first day in my very first battle was get myself captured. Now, frankly, I couldn't see no point in spending that whole war in some Yankee prison camp. So I had me an idea. I'm a good one for ideas. I got a hold of that warden, that Union general, and I said, General, I have uh, seen the error of the southern ways, and I've decided y'all must have the right of it. Why don't you give me a blue uniform, and I'll go to fighting on your side. And he fell for it. He gave me one of them blue uniforms, and squirreling my, sporting my brand new brown best musket, and a whistling John Brown's body, I marched off into battle. And that blue uniform did not make me one bit a better soldier. The very first thing I managed to do on my very first day in my second battle was get myself captured again. Now I figured if an idea had worked once, it had worked twice, so you know what I've done. I got a hold of that sudden warden and I said, I have seen the error of my ways. Won't you welcome me back into the fold? He gave me back one of them there butternut uniforms. And I marched off into battle again and got myself captured again. This is one fellow that was darn proud to see that war over with because by the end of it, I'd kind of forgot who I was supposed to be shooting at. One of them uniforms had captain stripes and I've been Captain John Hance ever since. And truth of it is, I had a pretty good job. I took a job with a fellow that I bet you never heard of, but I bet you heard of his brother. Y'all ever hear of Wild Bill Hickok? Yeah, did you know he had a brother? Me and Tame Bill Hickok was mule skinners. Now, a mule skinner's a popular fella. A mule skinner gets out ahead of the road sometimes. He's got a little wagon and a string of mules you can do right all right, and it works real good with the ladies too. Popular fella because you bring all the important necessities. Not just the tools, but the, the pots and pans, the bolts of cloth, the calico. You start carrying that stuff around. And one day I was out there riding along just as happy as could be on my old mule, riding along and off in the distance, I saw a cloud of dust. And I thought, now what is that? And then I heard a rumbly kind of sound. And I thought, what is that? And that cloud of dust started getting closer, and that rumbly sound started getting louder. And I realized that there, coming across that land, was a buffalo stampede. 
hundreds, dozens, thousands of buffalo are running right straight at me. And the one place you do not want to be is in front of a buffalo stampede because mules ain't fast. So I turned the mule loose. I said, go on, kitty honey, you're on your own. And, and I climbed a little skinny tree. There weren't many trees out there, but there was one little skinny one. And I climbed up that little skinny tree, and here come them a buffalo. And they was a running and a thundering and going past, and the dust was flying. They couldn't see anything. And they was a running, and they was running so fast, there was slobber flying out their face. And they was running along and galloping. They couldn't see what they was doing. And pretty soon, one of them darn buffalo banged into my tree. And my tree commenced to lean. And I thought, uh-oh. And then another one of them things banged into my tree again. And the tree commenced to lean some more. And I realized the only place worse than in front of a buffalo stampede is under a buffalo stampede. So I waited until the biggest, meanest, scariest fellow of all the one with the sharpest, curviest horns. I saw him running at me. I saw those red eyes burning, and he was around. I knew he was going to knock my tree clean to thunder. So when he got close enough, I jumped out the tree. I did. And I landed right in the middle of his back. And I sunk my fingers into that old woolly hair. And I rode, and I rode, and I rode. I rode him, I did. He run, and he run, and he run. And... And I realized he was coming here, and I was trying to turn him, but he wouldn't turn. And he galloped, and he thundered, and he brung me all the way here. Took two weeks. <laughs> Every once in a while, somebody says to me, Cabin Hans, two weeks on the back of a buffalo? What did you eat? I tell them, oh, that's easy. Every mule skinner's got his trusty sheath knife. And everybody knows the hump of the buffalo is the tastiest part. I just carved me off a sliver of buffalo hump, held it out in that hot Arizona wind. I had buffalo jerky for two weeks. He didn't like it much. He collapsed in a heap right over there. I got up and brushed myself off, and I said, Why, them people were wrong. This place is beautiful. So I built me a little cabin. I started bringing people up. I started figuring out how to survive here. I learned to hunt. Hunted them little pointy-eared squirrels. You've seen them little pointy-eared squirrels? Them things are weird. <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you something about western squirrels. you got to know how to cook them. And the way you cook these here squirrels at the Grand Canyon is you got to cook them three times. So first you shoot them, and then you skin them out, and you boil them. Boil them up in some water. And that makes them nice and tender-like, right? And then after you boil them, you, you, you dredge them in some flour and fry them up in some bear grease. And that makes them kind of crispy-like, you know? You fry it up, so you got them tender, then you got them crispy. Then you get yourself a bird egg and some more flours, and, 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 you, and you make noodles, egg noodles. And you put them in a big pot on a stove with a little of the leftover water from the boiling, and you put the squirrel in there, and you let it cook with the noodles, and then you throw away the squirrel and eat the noodles. <laughs> That's how it's done. You got to know all the tricks. And I thought I was pretty good at it, I have to admit. I was living all right, and one day, out there in front of my cabin, the funniest thing happened. A little flake of snow come down out of the sky and it landed right on the tip of my nose. And I thought, snow in Arizona? How can that be? And then another fluck of snow come down, and a little bit of more snow come down, and the next thing you know, it was snowing like a blizzard. All kind of snow coming. I thought, oh my goodness, I best get out of here. So I grabbed me an old willow tree from down by the river and I twisted it up and I made me some good willow snowshoes. You know, I knew how to do such things. I told you I knew the tricks. I strapped on them willow snowshoes and I decided I was going to head myself down to Flagstaff and spend the winter in Flagstaff, you know. I knowed where Flagstaff was because that buffalo had run right past it on the way here. And I was trudging around and that snow kept coming. 
And the next thing you know, the, the wind was blowing. And it, and it was getting colder, and the snow was getting deeper, and my beard was all froze, and, and oh, and I was trudging, trying to get to Flagstaff, and I realized I weren't going to make it too far, too far. I thought I better save myself. I better turn around. So I turned around thinking of my little cabin in the woods and I went trudging back and oh, the snow was cold and, and the ice was in my mustache and my beard and I was trudging through the snow and the wind was blowing and I, and I, and I, and I, and I got back to where my little clearing was, where my cabin was and I thought, no cabin. And I recognized that tree and I recognize this one. Where's my cabin? And I looked around a little bit more and I thought, I know where I am. Where's my cabin? Oh my goodness, somebody done stole my cabin. What I'm going to do now? And then I got to looking. And over there in the corner of the clearing, I saw a little hole in the snow with smoke coming out. And frankly, I had never seen smoke in snow. So I come over and I poked around with my walking stick and I found something solidy like and I went to digging and I realized that that was the chimbley of my cabin. The snow was so deep, the whole blame thing was buried. So I dug down and I found one of the windows and I shinned down in the window and I got it. I was so glad I'd left a little fire going. And I got into my cabin and I, and I took off my old wet clothes and oh, oh, so cold. Oh, hold my hands in front of the fire. And, and just as I thought it was going to be okay after all, I heard a sound, a rumbling sound like this. Oh, what? And then I heard it again. Oh, and I realized that that was my tummy. <laughs> I was so hungry. I had to eat something. So I commenced to looking around in my little cabin trying to find some food. And, and the squirrels were gone and the noodles were gone and, and I got to looking around and no food. And I looked over on the shelf next to my little water pitcher and no food. And I looked over next to the bedstead and no food. I even pulled the box out from underneath. No food. I thought, uh oh. Whoa. And then I found something. I found one jar of sweet, sticky blackstrap molasses. Ooh. I love blackstrap molasses, so tasty. Mm. So I got that blackstrap molasses down off the shelf and I went over to the little stove and, 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 and I put my skillet down on the stove and I, you know it's winter, you know, so molasses in the middle of winter, you know. I had to take my knife off and I carved the molasses and I put it down in the stove, I put it on the skillet and I let it start to warm up and cook. And I stirred it a little bit, and I thought, well, that don't look good. That needs something. So I got to looking around a little more, and over there next to my little water pitcher, I found one bar of Babbitt's Best Soap, rose-scented. Oh, smelled so lovely. Wonder what that'll taste like. So I took the soap over and I started slivering the soap down into the skillet next to the molasses. And I started stirring it up and I thought, oh, that smells lovely. But it needs something else. And then I got to looking. And there in the corner, I found one old boot. And I thought, now a boot is made out of leather. Leather is made out of cow. That's beef! So I carved the boot down into there with the molasses and I let it stir and simmer and when it got all cooked up, I thought, ha-ha, scooped up some of that with my wooden spoon and... 
<laughs> That's horrible. But if you are hungry, you will eat the next day. Still snowing. So I put some more to molasses in the skillet and took another sniff of the soap and put the soap in there. And I had to carve the eyelet thingies out of the boot, you know, and I let it stir some more. And this time I helped my nose. <laughs> Horrible. On the third day, still snowing, I was down to the sole of that old nasty boot. Do you know where a mule skinner's boot has been? But I ate it, I did. Next day the sun come out, a little crust of snow. I strapped on my, my willow snowshoes and made it out of Flagstaff. Look at the split. I was alive. But I will have you know, and I expect you'll believe it's true, eating like that for them days has plum ruined the toast, taste of soap for me ever since. I ain't eating it again. I decided I had to do better than that, so I planted me a little garden, sweet corn garden. And people said, Captain, you cannot grow sweet corn in the desert. There ain't no water. I said, well, the Indians grow corn. They said, yeah, but that ain't sweet corn, and they know what they're doing, and you don't. There ain't no water. I said, water will not be a problem. They said, what are you talking about? There ain't no water up here. I said, no, I told you I was in the Civil War. When I was in the Civil War, I had the, the biggest, strongest, most wonderfulest pair of binoculars you ever saw in your life. Binoculars so incredibly strong that when you looked at the river through them, it looked like it was only about six feet away. So I just strapped the dipper onto the end of my walking stick, looked through the binoculars, dipped water out of there, and I watered my sweet corn and it commenced to grow. I thought, oh, sweet corn for Christmas. And then I looked out there in my garden, and out there in my garden was a bear. A bear now. And I thought, I ain't going to have that. He, he stole one of my ears of sweet corn and took off with it. And I thought, I'll fix you. And I grabbed my rifle off the mantelpiece. I'm going to shoot him. And then I thought, now that is one skinny bear. And bear is better than boot for Christmas. You see, I know it all about bears because I lived with bears. Now, 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 you may end up sometime in your life going where bears go. If you're going to go where bears go, there's three things you got to know. I knew them already. I know it about bears. Three things you got to do. First, sew some little bells in your clothing because they'll tinkle and they'll jingle when you walk, and that way the old bear can hear you coming and you won't surprise him because you don't want to surprise a bear. And then you get yourself a big old bag of hot cayenne pepper. You know, like the Mexicans use, grind it up real fine. And if he comes at you, you fling it in his face, and it gets all in his mouth and his eyes, and he don't like that. And it maybe he'll leave you alone. But most of all, wherever you go, you got to keep your eye out for fresh bear poop. Because if you see fresh bear poop, you know there's a bear over there, and you better go the other way. Now, you know how you recognize fresh bear poop? It's full of little bells, and it smells like pepper. I saw that bear and I thought, that is one skinny bear. And bear is better than boot for Christmas. I'm going to let him fatten up. And every day that bear come back and ate more of my sweet corn. And every day he came and got more. And, and I hated to see my sweet corn go. But I sure did like to see that old bear grow. He got fat and sleek and beautiful. And I was thinking, bear meat for Christmas. And then one day, a little flake of snow come down out in the sky, and it landed on the old bear's nose. And he knew all about winter. He scooped up all the rest of my corn he did, and he took off for Flagstaff. <laughs> and I thought, oh my goodness, ain't going to have no corn, ain't going to have no bear neither, I'm going to get him. I grabbed my rifle and I went to chasing him. It was kind of funny chasing him because he was carrying all the corn in one arm. And he's running on three legs and I'm chasing him. I got up close. I took careful aim. I'm a good shot when I want to be. And I, I took careful aim and pow! 
now. I shot him, I did. I went to dance in a little jig. Bear meat for Christmas. Bear meat for Christmas. That weren't the smartest thing I ever done. Because the old bear weren't dead. And when I danced a little bit, I danced away from my gun. And he was closer to my gun than me. I had just winged him in his corn-carrying arm. And that old fella got up, and he looked at me with them evil eyes. Oh. And he took them big black claws, and he reached down, and he picked up my gun. And there ain't nothing in the whole wide world more frightening than a wounded bear with a gun. And he's smiling. I skinned it up a tree. You can split. And that old bear looked up at me, and I was shaking. That tree was shaking like an aspen leaf in a hurricane. And I was shaking, and, and that old bear, he put that gun against his shoulder, and he took one of them big black claws, and he stuck it in the trigger, and, and looked at me, and pa! Now, bears ain't as smart as they think they is. Because when he put the gun again his shoulder, he put the other end again him instead of the other end, and he shot himself. He did. Clean spung dead. That bear me for Christmas after all. I decided I better do better than that. So I started, you know, a tour guide and leading people down. Put an ad in the Flagstaff paper, and people could be commenced to come. And I realized I was going to have to feed them. And I decided... Down there in the canyon, at least, sometimes I just fed them canned tomatoes. But down there in the canyon, I realized I could feed them fish. Do you know there's fish in the Colorado River? There is. Now, there's something you need to know. The fish in the Colorado River, you ain't going to catch them by sitting on the bank with a rod and a line and a bait because they can't see the bait because this is muddy water, you know. But there's a way to catch these western fish. Chawn tobacco. Get yourself a big old plug of chawn tobacco, chew it up good. And get it nice and greasy. And fling it down into the river. And these is western fish. They like chawn tobacco. And they can smell it. And they'll come a sniffing and a snuffing. And they'll find that chawn tobacco. And they'll slurp it all up. And they'll commence to chewing it their self. And that's how you catch them. You hide down behind a rock, and when the old fish comes up for a spit, you whack him with a stick. That's how you catch them. You got to know all the tricks. I started taking people down in the canyon, started enjoying myself down there. People commenced to come and see me. I had my good horse. If you're going to be a tour guide leader, you need a good horse. I had a great horse. Name was Darby. I named all my horses Darby. That way I wouldn't forget the name. And Darby, oh, he was a good horse. Mind anything I told him to do, even if it was impossible. Do anything I said. I don't think he spoke English, but I think he understood it. One day I was bragging about old Darby. And these fellas, you know them eastern fellas? You know how they is? They looked at me and they said, Captain, you're always bragging about that darned horse. What's so special about him? I said, Darby will mind anything I tell him to do. They said, what if it's impossible? I said, there ain't nothing impossible for Darby. They said, okay, tell him to jump the Grand Canyon. And I said, well, now, I, told, I thought to myself, y'all have impugned the integrity of my steed. I'm going to make them suffer a little bit. So I told them, fellas, now you know perfectly well that that horse cannot stop on, stand on the edge of the Grand Canyon and jump straight across. And they said, yeah, we know. I said, no, got to get a run at it. He said, what you mean? I said, he's got to get a run at it. That means you got to build a road. You got to cut down the trees. You got to smooth everything off. You got to hammer the rocks and make some sand and some gravel and make me a nice road. We didn't have a road. I was tricking them, see? And you know they done it. They built the road. So I got old Darby out the barn, and he stuck his nose in my pocket looking for a little piece of carrot or sugar like he did, and I patted him on the neck, and I said, Darby, we're going to jump the Grand Canyon. 
And he looked at me like this, but he'd do what I tell him to do. I got up on top of old Darby. I settled in. I grabbed the reins tight, and he took off a running faster and faster and faster. And by the time he got to the edge of the Grand Canyon, there was far flashing from his hooves. And he got the edge of the Grand Canyon, and he took out the mightiest leap. And I was the first person to see the Grand Canyon from the air. Oh, that's beautiful. They're going to like that someday. And we're flying along. I thought a river go underneath. I thought, that's kind of nice. And then I saw Bright Angel Point go past, and Bright Angel Point. Oh, my goodness. You see them fellas, when they made that road, they didn't name it right. I was hoping to head over to Bright Angel Point. But when they made that road, they aimed at Crookedy. They aimed at a Bright Angel Creek. The canyon is 18 miles wide at Bright Angel Creek. There ain't a horse on the planet can jump 18 miles. <laughs> Next thing you know, we was falling. Oh, my goodness, coming down like a bolt out the blue. And we're falling, and I'm riding, and I thought this is the end of the captain and Darby. And my beard was all blowed back in the wind, and my clothes was a-flapping, and we were falling, and the walls of the canyon going past me faster and faster, and down and down and down and down we came. And I thought, oh, such a good horse. I hate to lose him. And then I thought, oh, Darby's a good horse. He don't mind anything I told him to do. So I waited till we got about two feet off the ground, and I yanked back on the reins and said, whoa, Darby, whoa! And he stopped right there in midair. I got down, built him a little step out of rocks, and we never tried that trick again. It was a whole lot easier to cross the Grand Canyon on snowshoes when the, when the fog comes in. You just hike on across. I did that several times. I had to give it up because one day the fog got a little bit lighter and I was stuck out there on one of them points for about two weeks. When the fog came back in, it was lighter, but so was I. So I made it back. You got to know this stuff. You got you to manage yourself. Now I'm going to tell you a little secret. If you're going to be a tour guide leader at the Grand Canyon, some of y'all might be tour guide leaders. Something you got to watch out for. Two things you got to watch out for, frankly. First thing you got to watch out for is women. Women is smart. They is inquisitive. They want to know everything. One day I'm riding along with a couple of pretty little gals, and we're riding on the mules, riding down in there, and one of them gals informed me that she was a botanist. I didn't really know what a botanist was, but I know it had to have something to do with trees. Because every time I turned around, that woman and her friend was off of the mule, looking at trees. They would look at the bark, and they would sniff it. Do you know people sniff these trees? They would sniff them and look at the branches and... I was like, lady, what's with the trees? She says, a tree is a marvelous organism. I said, a what? She said, it is a living being. I said, a living being? She said, yeah, just like you and me. I said, just like you and me? She says, yeah, a tree drinks water. I said, it does. She said, it breathes the air. I said, a tree can breathe? She said, well, of course a tree can breathe. I said, well, that explains it. She said, what does it explain? I said, I sleep under that one right there at night. And sometimes late at night, there's this raspy kind of sound. I bet the old boy snores. She didn't like it. And she kept looking at stuff. We'd ride a little bit farther, and she'd be off of the mules looking at a flower. Lady, get back on the mule." We ride a little bit farther, and she'd be off of the mute, wandering off. Every time I turn around, she's wandering off. I'm like, ladies, the canyon is dangerous. You got to quit wandering off. She said, oh, pshaw, Captain, don't worry about me. I can handle myself. I said, lady, this place is dangerous. Rode a little bit farther, and danged if she weren't off that mule again. Look at it, some little bush. And I, I said, lady... 
This place is dangerous. You're going to get yourself in trouble. And then I did a horrible thing. I did something that, sir, I want to give you some advice. Don't ever do this. I did it. I admit it. I looked at that young lady. Looked her square in the eye, I did. And this is what I did. I admit it. I pointed my finger right in her face. And I shook it at her. And I said, lady, you have got to quit wandering off. She put her hand on her hip. And she looked up at me with them fiery eyes. And she said, Captain, you don't seem to know much about women. You ever been married? And I said, Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have. And, and I can't talk about it. It's too sad. And she said, Oh, Captain, we're friends. You can tell me the story. And I said, No. It's too sad. And she said, Oh, tell the story. I said, Okay. I had a lovely wife. She was beautiful. Ankles, you would not believe. She could cook a boot better than anyone else. She only had one problem. She liked to go wandering off. And one day she wandered off on this trail right here. She did. And when she wandered off, she fell and she broke her leg. And them ladies said, Oh, my goodness, Captain. A broken leg at the Grand Canyon, that is a sad story. What did you do? How did you save her? I said, what are you talking about? She had a broken leg. I had to shoot her. <laughs> Them women never wandered off again the whole rest of the trip. They stuck to me like glue. But there's one thing worse than women. Don't let them fool you. Worst thing of all, men. These men show up here. You ought to see them. They come all duded up in their finest clothing and all the latest accoutrements. I took Theodore Roosevelt himself into the Grand Canyon, and the man wore a suit and tie to ride a mule. They dress so lovely, and they stroll along the edge of the canyon, looking beautiful in their finest clothing. They look so wonderful. They dress for each other, and they promenade along the edge of the Grand Canyon. One of them fellas one time, oh, he was lovely. You should have seen him. He was purdy. Had on the nicest clothes. He was lovely. He was showing off, as men will do. And that man informed me that he had on all the latest fashion. I said, what are the latest fashion? He informed me that he was shod and that on his very feet, he had the newest thing imported from Italy. He had upon his feet India, rubber, sold, hiking, boots. I said, what is a hiking boot? He said, it's a boot you walk in. I said, I walk in all of my boots. He said, no, this one's very special. It has rubber soles. I said, what's that good for? I don't know why you would put rubber on a boot. That stuff tastes terrible. <laughs> but he had the rubber soled boots. And he commenced telling me how light and airy they felt upon his feet so he could stroll all day with no discomfort. And perhaps I did not look sufficiently convinced. So he began telling me about the superior grippiness of rubber. I said, what's a grippiness? He said, the rubber grips the rock. I said, it grips the rock? He said, look. And he began strolling, jumping from rock to rock upon the edge of the Grand Canyon, 
showing me how well his boots could grip. And he looked over his shoulder at me and he said, see? And he made the next jump and he missed. And he fell into the canyon. 7,000 feet straight down. And he landed on the soles of them boots. <laughs> and he bounced. And the next thing, you hear him coming up. <laughs> up he come. I reach for him. I try to grab him. His eyes is about that big. And I try to grab him, but I missed. And <laughs> down he went again. And he landed on the soles of them boots again. And he bounced. And this went on and on and on. We got no sleep at all in the hotel room that night. Listen, that darn fool out there is squealing. Next morning, my old buddy Billy said, Captain, I can't take no more of that. I said, what you gonna do? He's bouncing on the boots. He said, I ain't putting up with it. I said, you're going to have to wait for him to starve. He's got to be hungry by now. He said, I ain't waiting that long. I'm going to shoot him. I said, shoot him? Oh, Billy, he's just stupid. You can't shoot all the stupid ones. We'll run out of bullets. He said, I'm shooting that one. He and his friends went and got their rifles. And they went right to the edge of the Grand Canyon. And, 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 and. And I heard him coming. He was sounding raspy. Uh, 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 uh. And he took careful aim, and right before he pulled the trigger, I knocked the gun away, and I said, no, Billy, don't kill him. I got an idea. He said, what's your idea? I said, I told you I was a mule skinner. I know how to twirl a lariat. Go get my rope. So he went and got his rope. And when that fella come up the next time, uh, 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 I throwed the rope over his shoulders, and I snatched him so hard, I snatched him right out of his boots, I did. And he laid there on the edge of the canyon going, oh, thank you for not shooting me. Ah, I'm hungry. Thank you for not killing me. And we were glad we didn't have to shoot him. We did have to shoot the boots, though, or they'd still be bouncing. You got to know everything. See, I like to tell stories about the Grand Canyon. Every once in a while, somebody comes up to me and they say, Captain, you know so much about the Grand Canyon. How come you know it all? I said, well, I've been here a long time. They said, no, Captain, you seem to know everything, things nobody else knows. And I said, well, that's true. They said, how come? I said, well, truth is, I dug it. <laughs> because the year after the incident with the bear, I planted more sweet corn. And one of them darn little rock squirrels come up. You seen them things? They will bite you. And that little rock squirrel come up and stole the ear of my corn and popped down his hole. And I thought, I'll fix you. I'm going to shoot him. And, but you can't shoot him. He went down a hole, right? Next day, he come up and stole another ear of my sweet corn. And I thought, what I'm going to do, I'll fix you. So I waited, and I watched him careful like. When he went down this hole, I saw him. And I went over, and I looked down there. And there he was, looking up at me with them little weird teeth of his, <laughs> eating my corn. I said, I'll fix you. I took my shovel, and I commenced to dig it. And he saw me coming. So he commenced to dig it. And then I commenced to dig it. And he commenced to digging. And I commenced to digging. And the next thing you know, I was digging and flinging and digging and flinging and digging and flinging and flinging dirt in every direction. And I looked up and I dug the whole Grand Canyon. <laughs> and I thought, now this place is beautiful. I think I'll keep it. I used to love to tell that story. Enjoyed it so much. And then one day, I was telling the story. And some little girl sitting right on the front row. You got to watch the little girls that sit right on the front row. Little innocent looking ones, just like this in here. Looked up at me all sweet like and she said, Captain, what did you do with the dirt? 
first time in my life I was ever speechless. <laughs> I lived here the whole rest of my life. I died here. I don't get out much. And they say that the last words I ever spoke on my last day on this earth was, I wonder what I've done with the dirt. <laughs> Truth of it is, stories is what makes this place special. Telling stories is something we can all do. Stories live, they breathe, they grow, they change, and stories are powerful. I told my stories. I lived here a long time, told lots of stories. Some of them people still tell them to this very day. So, if you think about it, the story ain't over. Every single one of you, you have your own story. When you leave here, you're going to tell your stories. When you leave here, you're going to tell people about this place. So do that. Tell your stories. Tell people about this place. And when you're telling them stories, tell at least one whopper for old Captain Hans. Will you do that for me? And thank you for visiting with me and listening to my stories tonight. <laughs> Folks, the captain really was a real guy. He really was the first one buried over here in the cemetery. He really did put in the first stage coach. He really did love to tell his stories. And I think the old man will be proud that you came and shared some of his stories with me tonight. And thank you for coming. If there's junior rangers, somebody's going to have to sign them for me. Captain Hans don't know what a junior ranger is. <laughs> Thank you, Sai, so much. Um, does anybody have a... All right. Come back to it, or yeah, I'll hang on to it in case. Hey, thanks. Enjoyed it. Well, thank you. Doing this show. That was great. Right. Really good. Really thank good you so job. much. You can tell I enjoy doing it. It's really fun. So All right. Fun. Yeah. Can I take your picture? Of course. Great. You want? Wait a minute. If you're going to take the picture, yeah. we got to do it the right way. All right. Thank you. 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 Excellent. Right, there you go. Sure. <clears throat> Sit right here beside me. Oh, sorry. You're, you're all right. Thank you for your story. <laughs> you can tell I have fun doing that. Oh. All right. Thank you. All right. Let me sign your book. Get it signed. Right over here in the cemetery. And, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, let's go, boys. We'll go, 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 we'll